In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O Father, you instruct the hearts of your faithful people by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant us in that same Spirit to savor what is right, and ever to rejoice in his consolation. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Well, thank you for coming in. Based on the foundation of, of, of Richard Rohr's uh, Universal Christ and the, the perspectives that he opened up, um, I'd like to go uh, present uh, two, uh, well, mystics, I would say, today. Uh, the first, uh, white, quite well known, the Jesuit uh, scientist and mystic uh, uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Uh, who died when he was my age, so I better watch out. Um, but uh, it's called The Mass on the World. It's from the Hymn, Hymn of the Universe. Um, of course, he was French, but this is an English translation. Um, and uh, uh, the Hymn of the Universe was like my Bible when I was a young Jesuit, when I was 18 or 19, the same age when he entered the Jesuits. Um, we even look alike, actually. Um, but this is uh, a beautiful uh, reflection called The Mass on the World. And this was, this was what he wrote when he was in the desert in China in, in one of his you know, expeditions. He was, a, you know, as you know, a, a geologist and a paleontologist. Um, and he, well, this is what he says. And it's very eloquent and very ornate language. But uh, so I'm really not going to comment so much as just read it, and then we can comment a little bit on it. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's you know s seven or eight pages long, uh, or ten pages. But uh, I'll offer an offering. Uh, so he says, since once again, Lord, uh, on the steps of Asia, Asia, I have neither bread nor wine nor altar. I will raise myself beyond these symbols, up to the pure majesty of the real itself. I, your priest, will make the whole earth my altar, and on it will offer you all the labors and sufferings of the world. And he's doing this, by the way, at dawn, so this is the beginning of a whole new day. So over there on the horizon, the sun has just touched with light the outermost fringe of the eastern sky. And once again, beneath this moving sheet of fire, the living surface of the earth wakes and trembles and once again begins its fearful travail. I will place on my patent, O God, the harvest to be won by this renewal of labor. Into my chalice, I shall pour all the sap which is to be pressed out from this day, out for this day from the earth's fruits. My patent and my chalice are the depths of a soul laid widely open to all the forces which in a moment will rise up from every corner of the earth and converge upon the spirit. Grant me the remembrance and the mystic presence of all those whom the light is now awakening to the new day. This restless multitude, confused or orderly, the immensity of which terrifies us, this ocean of humanity whose slow monotonous wave flows, uh, trouble the hearts even of those whose faith is most firm. It is to this deep that I thus desire all the fibers of my being should respond. All the things in the world to which this day will bring increase, all those that will diminish, all those that will die, all of them, Lord, I try to gather into my arms so as to hold them out to you in offering. This is the material of my sacrifice, the only material you desire. The growth of the world born ever onwards in the stream of universal becoming. Receive, O Lord, this all-embracing host, which your whole creation, moved by your magnetism, offers you at the dawn of a new day. This bread is our toil, is of itself, I know, fragmentation. This wine, our pain, I know, is no more than a draft that dissolves. Yet in the very depths of this formless mass you have implanted, and this I am sure of, I sense it, a desire, irresistible, hallowing, which makes us cry out. 
believer and unbeliever alike. Lord, make us one. Upon all that in the world of human flesh is now about to be born or to die beneath the rising sun, I will call down the fire. So that's what he's calling the consecration, calling down the fire, uh, which is already there. Fire, the source of being. You, my God, are the inmost depths. Hmm? Blazing spirit, fire, personal, super substantial. The consummation of a union so immeasurably more lovely and more desirable than anything we can dream. Radiant word, blazing power. You who mold the manifold so as to breathe your life into it, I pray you lay on us those your hands. Consider it powerful, omnipresent. May those invincible hands direct and transfigure for the great world you have in mind, that earthly travail which I have gathered into my heart and now offer you in its entirety. Remold it, rectify it, recast it down to the depths from which it springs. You know how your creatures can come into being only like shoot from a stem as part of an endlessly renewed process of evolution. Do you now therefore speaking through my lips pronounce over this earthly travail your twofold efficacious word, the word without which all that our wisdom and our experience have built up must totter and crumble. Over every living thing which is to spring up, to grow, to flower, to ripen during this day, say again the words, this is my body. And over every death force which, which waits in readiness to corrode, to wither, to cut down, speak again your commanding words which express the supreme mystery of faith, this is my blood. So once again, the fire has penetrated the earth, not with sudden crash of thunderbolt, driving the mountaintops, does the master break down doors to his own home. Without earthquake or thunderclap, the flame has lit up the whole world from within. All things individually and collectively are penetrated and flooded by it. From the inmost core of the tiniest atom to the mighty sweep of the most universal laws of being. So naturally has it flooded every element, every energy, every connecting link in the unity of our cosmos, that one might suppose the cosmos to have burst spontaneously into flame. In the new humanity which is begotten today, the word prolongs the unending act of his own birth. And by virtue of his immersion in the world's womb, the great waters of the kingdom of matter have without even a ripple been endued with life. No visible tremor marks this inexpressible transformation, and yet, mysteriously and in very truth, at the touch of the supersubstantial word, the immense host, which is the universe, is made flesh. Through your own incarnation, my God, all matter is henceforth incarnate. Now, Lord, through the consecration of the world, the luminosity and fragrance which suffuse the universe take on for me the lineaments of a body and a face in you. Your creatures not merely, the fact that your creatures are not merely so linked together in solidarity that none can exist unless all the rest surround it, but that all are so dependent on a single central reality that a true life born in common by them all gives them ultimately their consistence and their unity. And of course, he means Christ, which, whom he calls the omega point to which all are, 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 are moving. Lord Jesus, in whom all things subsist, show yourself to those who love you as the higher soul and the physical center of your creation. Are you not well aware that for us, this is a question of life or death? As for me, if I could not believe that your real presence, there it is, real presence, animates and makes tractable and enkindles even the very least of the energies which invade me or brush past me, would I not die of cold? Grant, Lord, that your descent into the universal species, <laughs> the Eucharistic species pronounced the whole universe, your descent into the universal species may not be for me just something loved and cherished, like the fruit of some philosophical speculation, but may become for me truly a real presence. Mm -hmm. 
and then communion. What I must do when I have taken part with all my energies in the consecration, which causes its flames to leap forth, is to consent to the communion, which will enable it to find in me the food it has come, the food it has come in the last resort to seek. So he's the food, you know, receiving that food. Hmm? Goes on to say, that's a terrifying thing to have been born. <laughs> a great scary responsibility in other words, but now to surrender myself uh, to, this, to this mystery. So, he, and, and, and then he goes on to speak at the very end about the death and the diminishment. So the consecration of the world would have remained incomplete a moment ago had you not with special love vitalized for those who believe not only the life bringing forces, but also those which bring death my communion would be incomplete, would quite simply not be Christian, if together with the gains which this new day brings me, I did not also accept in my own name and in the name of the world as the most immediate sharing in your own being, those processes hidden or manifest of enfeeblement, of aging, of death, which unceasingly consume the universe. My God, I deliver myself up with utter abandon to those fearful forces of dissolution, which I blindly believe will this day cause my narrow ego to be replaced by your divine presence. The man who is filled with an impassioned love for Jesus, hidden in the forces which bring death to the earth, him the earth will clasp in the immensity of her arms as her strength fails, and with her he will awaken in the bosom of God. And there's a final couple page prayer, which seems mostly directed to the sacred heart, to which, uh, uh, for which Teilhard had his very strong devotion, as many Jesuits do. Uh, the heart of the universe is the heart of Christ. And he quotes, he says, he says the words of her, uh, your great servant, and he doesn't, it's not identified who said this, said this. It might have been, I don't know, St. Margaret Mary, I don't know. Lord, lock me up in the deepest depths of your heart, and then holding me there, burn me, purify me, set me on a fire, sublimate me till I become utterly what you would have me be through the utter annihilation of my ego, in that sense that we've come to know as the false self, which has to die. So part of that prayer, Let's see. For me, my God, all joy and all achievement, the very purpose of my being and all my love of life all depend on this one basic vision of the union between yourself and the universe. Dominated as I am by a vocation which springs from the inmost fibers of my being, I have no desire, no ability to proclaim anything except the innumerable prolongations of your incarnate being in the world of matter. I can preach only the mystery of your flesh, you the soul, capital S, shining forth through all that surrounds us. In the last paragraph, it is to your body in its fullest extension that is, to the world become through your power and my faith the glorious living crucible in which everything melts away in order to be born anew. It is to this that I decade to dedicate myself with all the resources which your creative magnetism has brought forth in me, with the all too feeble resources of my scientific knowledge, with my religious vows, with my priesthood, and most dear to me, with my deepest human convictions. It is in this dedication, Lord Jesus, I desire to live. In this, I desire to die. Guess when he wrote this? 1923, exactly 100 years ago. But it's really from yesterday or tomorrow, if you will. So, I think this shows you too if what's really happening in any mass is what should be is, is happening in, in, in the whole world and vice versa. 
that it's everything's being consecrated and brought forward in evolution, you know, towards the Omega point, towards Jesus. Uh, someone was asking, you know, if everything is already the body of Christ, then what happens at Mass? And I said, well, obviously with the work of the whole uh, assembly and the priest and, you know, the, the whole atmosphere, uh, the presence of Jesus in the sacrament itself, uh, there's a, an increased intensity in presence, which you can also see reflected in his words here. But there's more going on. And this, is, of course, is very traditional theology about the efficacy of the Mass, is that the, the world is being transformed. Just like there was a consecration of the whole universe, that's what's happening at Mass. The whole universe is being consecrated because the Christ there who's working in us and in the community is consecrating the whole universe. And not just for the intention of the Mass, of course, that's part of it, but offering himself, as we always say, you know, to the Father for the whole world. Uh, and his presence is there, you know, in everything and everyone. So the world is like in Romans 8, is, is bringing, is coming to birth through the power of the Spirit to a whole new level of, of life and reality, ultimately to the Omega point, which is the, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, as Jesus says in the book of Revelation. Uh, and, you know, he, he also, you know, quotes in that, in that last prayer, uh, the beautiful uh, image of uh, Christ from the first chapter of, of the book of Revelation, which all struck me when I was that age and when I was 18 or 19 as well. Uh, the forehead is of the whiteness of snow, the eyes are of flames of fire, the feet are brighter than molten gold, the hands carry the stars, you are the first and the last, the living and the dead and the risen again. And to you gather exuberant unity, every beauty, every affinity, every energy, every mode of existence. It is you to whom my being cries, cries out with a desire as vast as the universe. In truth, you are my Lord and my God. So there's something hugely dynamic going on, which is why the Eucharist is the source and center of our life, because the whole universe is always involved. And it's because Christ, who is the heart of the universe and whose body is the universe, is transforming the universe and transfiguring it ever more fully into himself. Hmm. We'll save the questions and the discussion until after the second part of uh, today's lecture. Now, as I say, Cynthia Bourgeois is also a modern mystic, as she's been called, and I think rightly. Uh, like Richard Rohr, she's also a personal friend. Uh, she's written wonder, many wonderful books, but one of the most enduring uh, is called The Wisdom Jesus. How many of you have read it? <laughs> Get it and read it! Um, the whole point of the book, basically, The Wisdom Jesus, is unlike all the other ways of seeing Jesus, the incarnate word, the redeemer, all of this, you know, the, the Pantocrator, uh, if we could go back to Jesus as the wisdom teacher, incarnate wisdom himself, of course, but that's the whole point. He's a wisdom teacher, and he shows us the roads of wisdom, which is not just knowing things as they are, but being transformed by them and in them, as we've just seen in Teon, so that we reach new levels of existence and consciousness, which should be happening at every Mass and Communion, uh, through him, uh, and that is his major function. That's what he came to do more than anything else. So with that background, we can understand a chapter on the Eucharist, uh, as we'll see. It's a short chapter, and just as important it's in its footnotes, as I'll point out, as in its text. Um, it begins <laughs> with her first Holy Communion, which was an accident. She was a, a Quaker, a, a Christian Science. That was what she was raised in, and you know, which was you know, a, kind of a wis it was a wisdom tradition. But she, had, oh, as she said, I was in ever more, I was in blissful, more or less blissful ignorance that the whole world of sacrament and ritual even existed. But what happened when she was in college? She went with her college roommate to a church in, in Ontario uh, to hear a, a visiting uh, boys' choir, and somehow got caught up in the communion line. Her, her, her roommate was Catholic. And so she was rustled up there and she was whispering to her roommate what to do. And just watch me and do what I do, she says, the roommate. Uh, so don't you, she says. And all, um, but she received the Eucharist. 
So about two-thirds of the way back to my pew, I suddenly knew, well, that's that. Quietly, not like some thunderous, that's that, is what she experienced in italics. Quietly, not like some thunderous charismatic conversion, I simply knew that I had met my match. Something utterly real, strangely compelling, strangely familiar had entered my life that day. Something I didn't even know I'd been missing, but which for the first time made life feel really right. Even more impressive to me was the fact that I knew I knew this. It was that intimate an experience. I was once again standing naked before the invincible certainty of my own heart. And what leads me to place so much weight on this experience is the fact that so far as I know, it came completely out of the blue. I had no preparation, no catechism, no expectation. This was a meeting, my naked instincts told me, a direct encounter with a person who subsequently has never been seriously absent from my life. Long before I had absorbed any theology of memorial meals or sacrificial lambs, while I was still clueless about the subtle nuances of consubstantiation and transubstantiation, I knew the Eucharist as a place where I, in my human form, encountered the living Jesus in his subtle energetic form. That is what has stayed with me all these years and is still basically my touchstone as I keep working my way between the worlds, these different levels of life and consciousness and existence. So the whole point is that Jesus is now in a subtle energetic form. That's what we mean by the risen body. That's what we mean by Jesus extending to the whole, filling the universe in all its parts. Not, you know, in the time-bound weight, space, and time that was before, but, you know, as we receive him in the Eucharist. So it's an encounter with the wisdom Jesus in these higher realms, but it's a living encounter. And that's what she, uh, she points out. Hmm? So she develops this theme based on her experience and on her reflections. Uh, asking, you know, what was Jesus doing on the night of the Last Supper? And here's where it gets, this is why I call this more of a discussion than a, <laughs> than a lecture, because it's well, a little controversial. By the way, Cynthia is about, you know, a couple of years older than I am too, so she's also in her 70s at this point. So we assume that Jesus' purpose here on earth was to found a new religion called Christianity. If you unconsciously or consciously buy into that assumption, it's impossible to avoid viewing the Last Supper through the rosy-colored glasses of sacramental theology. On the eve of his death, Jesus instituted the central ritual of the Christian church and ordained his 11 male disciples as his priests and apostles. Virtually nothing could be farther from the truth. Okay, we're not gonna go that far, but what was Jesus' intention really? I mean, the whole question of, did Jesus mean to found a new religion? Even Richard Rohr has raised that issue, and he said in parentheses when he wrote, Jesus did not come to found a new religion. He said, Christians, please don't hate me. Uh, one could, whether you agree with that or not, he certainly, what he certainly did was bring a life and a teaching to purify all religions to purify the religious instinct of people to make sure it didn't go down the wrong path. That's why he criticized so severely the Pharisees and all those who went down the wrong path. And he showed by his life and teaching what, what it was really about, communion. <laughs> we talk about going to communion. Well, are we in communion with him and with one another? As she points out in the next page, he only told us to love one another. <laughs> And even if you believe that Jesus, you know, was trying to form a group of disciples to start, a, you know, a new path, uh, the real founder of Christianity as we know it is not Jesus. It's St. Paul. Think about that anyway. It's a proposition. The real founder of Christianity as we know it is more like more St. Paul, and, who, of course, was, you know, met Jesus and, you know, in his, his conversion experience and was inspired by Jesus, etc. But she goes on to speak a, a little bit about Judas and all, which, which is not germane to our talk here, but uh, uh, he opened up, Jesus, uh, she says, Jesus opened up a classic subtle body channel 
resurrection body channel, if you will, between himself and his disciples, using bread and wine as the specific vehicles of his presence. So that was his intention, to create, to create uh, uh, through the vehicles of the bread and wine, a subtle body channel where we could commune in our deepest level with his deepest level in what we do call Holy Communion. So in the surprisingly relevant language of modern computer programming, and I didn't know this, but she says, the bread and wine become an instantiation, not consubstantiation, transubstantiation, not that she's denying, you know, that she, let's call it, she's proposing, let's call it instantiation, a specific instance, instantiation of his own resurrection body. So Jesus is there. In, his, as, in and as his resurrection body. It's an instantiation. It's a moment right here and now where we contact it. Instantiation. So she's proposing, why don't, well, you can look, not, in, not instead of, but in addition to, possibly in preference to, uh, what we've been saying so far. So through their intentional participation in this spiritual practice, the disciples could continue to ingest his energetic presence. And he, and he could continue to reach them from, quote, inside their own skins at a subtle energetic level. You know, and, and Cynthia Bourgeau has written recently on, you know, the, the imaginal realm, the different realms, you know, which he got from Gurdjieff, etc. Uh, but you can, I think you can, even without that background, you can understand, you know, what she's saying here. Hmm? So... Uh, and she does mention Gurdjieff here. So a memorial meal, a proclaiming his death until he comes in glory. Again, she proposes that's more St. Paul and Jesus. You know, not, not wrong, but I mean, that, do this in memory of me, okay, but is that Jesus saying that or is it the church? You know, so it got into scripture, but where did it come from? So that's another scriptural interpretation question. It's a living remembrance, she says through which his spiritualized personhood could continue to flow into them as living presence, blessing, and wisdom. So she says, you know, that this was all intuitively known in the first centuries of the church, like in a dance of cosmic intimacy. And as I said last week, giving the history of the Eucharist, there was no big discussion about, you know, how did it work, what it meant, it just lived it. It was so intense, as it should be, you know, for us as well. Gradually, excitement faded, she said. Maybe it had to. Uh, Christians fled into the desert after the, uh, the fourth century Christianity was suddenly catapulted from a forbidden sect to an imperial religion. That's been talked about a lot, of course. The majority put their energies into building basilicas and hammering out creeds. And gradually, like a tide of ardor slowly receding from the world, Christianity was changed into a religion about Jesus rather than a religion of Jesus. It did tend to get pretty abstract and people were fighting over concepts and you know, the lived reality, not so emphasized. Hmm. So the same thing, then the Eucharist shrank to a memorial meal or a fellowship meal or a cultic ritual. Uh, at its most primitive download, she says, a kind of cultic magic in which the bread and wine were separated from any notion of a remembrance meal and venerated as holy objects in their own right. Okay, we touched on that issue last week about Eucharistic adoration and the monstrance. So she's, she's, she, she says in a footnote, you know, what I tried to say too, you know, this, is, is, this could be a beautiful practice where people really do experience, you know, the presence of Jesus. Hmm. Many Christians claim, she says, and I myself have experienced, as have I, that there is a palpable energy emanating from the tabernacle. Yeah, it's a powerful energy. My own preference, she says, is to see this as a force field, residing not so much in the objects themselves as in the energy of intention that they bear from their side, but also from our side. And that goes back to the you know, real presence to real presence that I was talking about last week. It's a mutual uh, connection. Uh, however one interprets it, the energy is sufficiently perceptible as to suggest caution and just, we wouldn't just label it some magical thing. So she's, uh, she's uh, agreeing, you know, with, you know, uh, the, the, as I do, you know, with, with 
kept in its proper perspective of Eucharistic adoration. So Jesus never asked anyone, she says, to form a church, ordain priests, develop elaborate rituals in institutional churches, splintering into denominations, or we can discuss that. Uh, but his two great requests, and this is absolutely true, were love one another, as I have loved you, and that we share bread and wine together as an open channel of that interabiding love. There you go. That was so we could encounter him in that love, mutual love, and one another in that mutual love, all as and in the body of Christ. That's what it's for. That's what it's for. Hmm? More controversial stuff coming up. Hmm? I deeply regret the tendency so evident in the Roman Catholic Church these days, after 40 years of remarkable ecumenical sharing and openness, to once again circle its wagons and restrict access to communion to, quote, card-carrying Catholics only. That is, those in full conformance with the Roman Catholic magist magisterium. If these good bishops really trusted the master they claimed to believe in, rather than locking up the Eucharist in doctrinal prisons, they would follow Jesus' great counsel in his parable of the wedding feast and go out to the highways and byways and invite everyone in so that Jesus himself could do the teaching quotes from the inside in the manner that he himself inaugurated and sanctioned. From my own experience, you know, of that first Holy Communion, from my own experience, I can attest that he is fully capable of making his presence known. You know, sometimes you see when at weddings and funerals, the whole back of the program is who's allowed to come to communion and why and how, you know. Uh, yeah, okay, but a few cautions. Jesus doesn't need our protection. We need his protection. Jesus doesn't belong to us. We belong to him. Jesus is perfectly able to take care of himself. So what are we protecting, or whom are we protecting? We're protecting our institution, which is fine. Okay, we do respect the guidelines. But is it really in conformity with how Jesus would act? Are we protecting Jesus or are we just protecting the church and its, its rules of belonging and initiation? And if the latter, well, okay, okay, that's legitimate. We follow them. But we need to also always be questioning them. Whom does this really serve? Does it really serve Jesus to do it this way? It's at least a question we need to ask. And she says, it's not my place, of course, to challenge the survivalist mentality of an embattled power structure, only to point out that once, once again, how foreign this stance is to Jesus' own canonic path. Across the board in Christianity, retrenchment seems to be in the air. As institutions fight for their lives and basic theological premises and established ways of doing things are an upheaval everywhere. I believe that this ferment is necessary and good. Through it, Christianity will either grow into an appropriate form to match the consciousness of the 21st century, or else it will disappear as an institution and will be left face to face with the naked presence of Christ. Not such a bad option when you come to think of it, she says. <laughs> Maybe we have to be brought all the way down before we can go up again, if we ever go up again, Jesus came down, kenosis, etc. She says, most of the church's articulations of the Eucharist to date have been at lower levels of consciousness, according to Ken Wilber's uh, levels, more mythic and rational, very conceptual, very tribal. That's perfectly true, and it's not a very elevated level of consciousness. But at heart, the Eucharist is a wisdom practice, originating from a non-dual level of consciousness. Jesus and I, are, Jesus and, and we are one, we are one with one another, non-dual not separate. And it is at that level that, is that it truly comes into its own. Amen. Amen. That all may be one. That's what it's for. You just heard Teilhard pray for that, right? Everyone, Christian or not, he says, desires that oneness. When the bread and, li and wine are directly seen as an instantiation rather than a consubstantiation or a transubstantiation of the mystical body of Christ, we step through them into the living reality of interabiding love and meet the wisdom master face to face. 
both our own eternal reality and his are never again in question. And we are able more and more surely to become as he is, living our lives in the great flow of giving and receiving. So she says, you know, for all his constrictions and distortions at human hands, it's a genuine meeting place, an exchange between the realms through which you will be nurtured and grow in your wisdom journey, the Eucharist. So she says, find a parish or find a place that, that, that fits, that's doing it well, that, that you can, that you can uh, vibe to and live it. Because it is, as she says of herself, it's something that, you know, has become an integral part of her own life. And just a foot, the final footnote, which is also very interesting about, you know, transubstantiation, consubstantiation, when it's Jesus is in the bread, you know, etc. Um, to my mind, she says, both of these traditional sacramental theologies are looking at the pack picture backward. The issue is not so much how Jesus enters time and form as how we ourselves are transported beyond it. So in other words, never mind how Jesus gets in. How do we get out, you know, of our limited humanity? How does the Eucharist transform, transport us into Jesus? Not how does Jesus get into us, but how do we get into Jesus? That should be the presence that we're, that should be the, 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 uh, the, the task. That should be the challenge. That should be the privilege that we're looking at. How can I allow Jesus, however he's there, to take me wherever, to wherever he is, which is everywhere? and in union with everything. This new model, she says, of instantiation offers a helpful resolution to the dilemma, suggesting that as an all holographic reality, you know, where everything reflects everything else, you know, in the body of Christ, the process is instantaneous and completely reciprocal. Since at root, the whole and the part can never be separated from one another. Okay, so she says, you know, coming from outside the Catholic uh, perspective, some things that are, you know, pretty challenging, and you know, we questions that are worth considering, you know, within our within our own, you know, Catholic tradition as well. Uh, so uh, I'll leave it at that, and you can uh, offer some questions or some uh, some reflections.